first of all, thank you very much for, uh, to the organizers for inviting me, and also thank you for the audience for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, archaic human diets, but I'm going to do this in broad brush strokes, and I want to cover a lot of time. But hopefully, maybe it will be helpful in connecting some of the earlier talks to some of the later ones. For starters, uh, just, just uh, in the interest of full disclosure, human beings are omnivores, and they probably always were. So when we talk about diet, we're not necessarily debating whether they ate meat or not, but trying to look at how these different sources of food, including fungi, are folded into people's lives. And what I'd like to explore here is a little bit about its, its social consequences as well. Because getting food, processing food, is all, all involves labor. It often involves cooperation. And by looking at some of the dietary transitions, we can learn something, we can learn things about the overall changes in the overall fabric of human societies and patterns of human cooperation. Now, so, so meat is, is obviously just one window on ancient human diets. It's an important one in a surprising number of ways. First of all, uh, meat, and especially meat and other tissues from large mammals, are rare in nature. They're relatively uncommon yet they're very high quality and they offer complete protein and in animals that are in good condition, they also, also offer quite a bit of fat to, that can be seasonal. Uh, they're aseasonal in their availability, which means that even when plant productivity may wax and wane in a system, meat does tend to be uniformly, or at least available over the, the full range of the year. And in the case of big animals, even if they're tough to get, they come in really large packages. So it's very difficult for foragers to overlook this. These are, it's just a very interesting property of meat. In addition, there are a lot of interesting social rules wrapped around or associated with the capture of meat as well as the consumption and as well as its, its distribution. So there's a lot we can learn here. Now when it comes to human diets, one way of thinking of them is, is how much is plant and how much is animal. But I'd like to redirect your attention a little bit here to think about something, something else. And that is the cost of getting different kinds of food, the cost of processing them. In other words, the relationship between what you lay out in terms of effort in technology and everything else, fire, whatever, fuel, uh, and what you get for the return. And what you'll see is that there are animals, and there are plants, and there are probably fungi, on, on both sides of the equation. And as many people who have worked with modern foragers can tell us, uh, even though large animals can be difficult to get, when, and, and the supplies can be somewhat uneven or sporadic, uh, the, the return for the effort is very high, or tends to be very high, and thus people uh, continue to do it as much as they can. Uh, but of course, they're also eating lots of uh, other foods that come from the plant world. And uh, if they're abundant, uh, they will tend to be preferred in the sense that as long as all of this is giving a balanced diet, that is, you're getting your vitamin C, you're getting your protein, you're getting your carbohydrates or your fats, that they will prefer, if they're available or, or abundant, foods that are more easily obtained, more easily processed prior to getting them in your mouth, these are what we call higher return uh, or, or higher nutritional return foods for the effort that you lay out. On the other side of the equation are all sorts of delicious foods, and we know that uh, many people eat them in the modern era and also in the past. And you'll notice, once again, there are plant products here and there are also animal. By the way, uh, we could probably put honey in the high nutritional uh, yield area, and we could probably put tubers, or at least most tubers here on the right. And what you see are a variety of plant seeds, tubers would be included. Uh, you have to do some work to make them edible. And usually there are technological indicators of this, like milling technology and so on, in the archaeological record. But there are also a variety of small animals that are very quick, not so easily gathered, and although people are capable of hand catching them, such as hares, it's a lot of work per uh, animal gained, and therefore the return can be much lower. Now you can overcome these costs, or, or this problem, technologically, but then you pay the cost in terms of technology instead. So these are, this is an interesting dichotomy. I'm oversimplifying, that, uh, oversimplifying it a little bit, but this is a nice framework for looking at uh, three very important, I think, 
uh, dietary changes that have happened in prehistory. From somewhere after, or somewhere around a, a half a million years ago, or a little bit earlier, to uh, the Pleistocene-Holocene transition. Now, uh, these are strictly from a zooarchaeological perspective. And the nice thing about uh, the zooarchaeology is that you're working with bones that have a good probability of being preserved, regardless of whether the animals are quick or slow, large or small. That's the problem with plants, as, as many experts will tell you. OK, first is the ascendance of a top tier predator. Now, this, this doesn't mean that they only eat meat, but it does mean that we have the evolution of a large game hunting species. And uh, we know for sure at this point that uh, this, this characteristic evolved at least 400, probably 500,000 years ago. And it could be earlier. We simply don't know yet. It could be as early as a million. It coincides, by the way, in a very general sense with the emergence of fire and, and uh, ubiquity of fire as a technology. But uh, correlation is not necessarily identifying a causal relation there, although it could be. Second is expanding dietary breadth. And the time interval of, of very special interest I want to focus on is 70 to 50,000 years ago. There may be some earlier cases, but this is when it really concentrates across Africa and Eurasia. And then the third one, which might be a little bit more familiar to some of you in the audience than, than the other two, and that is the domestication of hoofed animals, which we now know occurred uh, by at least 10,500 years ago in the case of sheep and goats, and probably a little bit earlier than that. Most of the evidence, but not all, that I'll be talking about comes from work that I've done, as well as that of close colleagues, including John Speth here. Uh, and I'm going to focus especially on the Mediterranean basin, because this is an area with very diverse biota, lots to choose from. And so you can get a sense of what people are choosing to eat and what they're actually ignoring. Large game hunting has very deep roots. And there's a little paradox here in the sense that uh, by 400, 500,000 years ago, people are taking down large bison. They're taking down the, the huge ancestor of, of cattle known as the aurochs and a variety of other hoofed animals. And they're doing it with relatively simple technology, at least simple by our standards. They had uh, very nicely crafted, balanced wooden spears, which are, are nothing to sneeze at. They may have had, in some of the later, uh, after uh, 100,000 years ago, some stone-tipped weapons, but nothing like what we see in, in later prehistory in terms of technological sophistication. This kind of hunting is, is very doable for humans, especially if it's shock and track hunting. Uh, but it involves very close, it requires close cooperation of more than one, one person. And uh, during these periods, because of uh, what we, at least some of us think is a, a pretty high level of carnivory, uh, these would be very small social groups, which means that most of the individuals in the group that are at least able to be mobile are probably helping in some way, not only to act as surrounds in assisting hunting, but also obviously in processing and moving the carcasses to places where they can be processed uh, more thoroughly. I think uh, Maurice Wilson had it right. This is a, a beautiful illustration now, I think, uh, in possession of the British Museum. But it gives you an idea of, of sort of the reconstructions of hunting. And uh, we do have an idea of some of the technology, although it's organic. Uh, for example, the case of Schoeningen at 400,000 years ago and the beautiful wooden spears with uh, horse carcasses from there. We don't get lucky, that lucky very often, but it does give us an idea of what that technology would be. So uh, the, in this graphic, the x-axis is time. And actually, that, that should go back to 400,000 years ago. I don't know why I didn't take it further back. And the y-axis is just the, the percentage of meat biomass in the diet that comes from big hoofed animals as opposed to any of a variety of small animals. And what you can see is that up to about uh, 50 or 40,000 years ago, 95 to 99% of all of the meat biomass is coming from big animals. At least that's what the zoo archaeological record tells us. Something happens after that. Uh, in other words, uh, in the upper Paleolithic and later, some people continue to, to operate in a similar way, at least in terms of animal exploitation. But you're seeing a lot more variation. And in terms of averages, 
we see a rising proportion of small game animals entering the diet. Now, so we can look at this in a little more detail in terms of costs and benefits and learn something about what is almost certainly a reorganization in human economies. Okay, this brings me to uh, the second trajectory of interest, and this has been called by many the Broad Spectrum Revolution, or BSR. And uh, we find evidence of this. The best evidence so far is coming between 70 and 50,000 years ago for the major transition, or at least a permanent uh, sort of uh, effect. And we see this in the upper Paleolithic of Eurasia from the very beginning. And we see it in the later part of the MSA in Africa. Dates vary. A lot of the small animals that are being added to the diet, some are, some are collectible. They're you know, like ostrich eggs, they're uh, tortoises, things that you can collect pretty easily. But what else is being added in ever higher proportions are small quick animals. Animals such as rabbits, hares, uh, a variety of game birds, squirrels, uh, certain other species as well. And the problem with these animals is that, the quick animals, is that while they're perfectly good meat, in, in, at least in some cases, uh, although they can be lean, is that uh, they are expensive to, to uh, capture. And usually this is absorbed, at least in recent cultures, in terms of technological costs. So we can rank different kinds of small animals, which are fairly similarly sized in terms of the food value fairly similar in fat values, though not entirely. And what we see is that things like tortoises, ostrich eggs, shellfish, at least those that live on surfaces that are not deeply buried in the sand, are cheap. They're not very big, but they're cheap. So they have a high rank. They give a high return relative to the amount of work for the size of the food uh, within the class of small animals. Then we have this other group, which are delicious, but they're more expensive and therefore lower ranked. Because in order to really make capture more efficient, you need some kind of technological interface. So by the Upper Paleolithic, and in some phases of the uh, African MSA, we see ever richer mixes of high cost and low cost foods. And this is what we mean by the broad spectrum revolution. And evolving on the, heel of the heels of this it are some very interesting radiations in capture technology. Some of this is organic. They're very difficult to find in the archaeological record. But we do find some elements of it, like diversification in types of points, sizes of points, designs, bone technology, and so on. Now, towards the tail end of this broad spectrum revolution, that is when it's really revving up after the last glacial maximum, and especially after 13,000 years ago, some other things are happening as well. People in some areas, not all, are beginning to settle down. They're beginning to form permanent, or at least semi-permanent, uh, villages, uh, investing in architecture in a way that we've never seen before. The example here is a Shikla Huyuk in central Turkey. And this dates, these lowermost layers date between 10 and a half and 11,000 uh, years ago. Well, some very interesting things about this. This area is considered, and, and almost certainly is, the heartland for the domestication of wild sheep. Central Anatolia. Now, what we're trying to understand in a case like this is what human behavior somehow could lead to reproductive isolation of large herbivores, and in this case, sheep and goats, especially sheep. And we do this a lot of different ways uh, in terms of evidence. One is to look at changes in species importance. And we do see this counterintuitive resurgence of large animal use. We look at herd, herd structure, especially skewing in the age and um, sex structure. And uh, the other thing we're interested in is the extent to which spaces on site are somehow shared with these animals. And what's the evidence there? Well, dumb. Morphological changes are interesting, but that happens long after animals are domesticated. So we don't, we don't need to think about that. Well, here's the story at Ashikla Huyuk. And this is a, a very early case, so I think a good example. And what you can see here is that uh, on the far right, which is the earliest assemblage, um, and these are just percentages. I'm not giving you the total sample or anything. Then we have a classic broad spectrum situation there. 28% of all of the animal foods that are coming into the diet are from small animals. And it's all kinds. It's fish. It's hares. It's hedgehogs. It's uh, turtles, and so on. So a complete even mix 
of, of high and low cost small animals. And sheep and goats are already very important in the diet. They're about 50%. By the, the end of this short sequence, and we're still continuing to work at this site, you see a very different situation. You see that small game is now only 4% of the diet. That very little change, very few changes are occurring in uh, other ungulate species, such as horse and red deer. But sheep and goats are now 75% of the meat input. And another animal that's uh, kind of surprising us, actually, um, is, is aurochs, which is also increasing at that time. We also have uh, skewed age structures, which I'm going to just skip over this pretty quickly. But uh, this kind of skewing in age structures is something you never see in, in hunted animal populations. I've been working on these problems for a long time in the Paleolithic. Never have I seen this. That's evidence of human management. And very quickly, we know from my micromorphological studies that we have in situ dung deposits even at 10,500 years ago and before in between and within buildings. Okay, so that's just a quick review of the evidence. Each of these dietary transitions has energetic, social, and coevolutionary aspects. In other words, it isn't just people that are affected, it's, it's the biota around them as well as the landscapes. Energetic ramifications, very quickly. Well, being a top predator means uh, very uh, light, thin populations on landscapes and chronically small group sizes. And, and very high mobility, living very high in the trophic uh, pyramid. Expanding the diet uh, means that you're basically eating more of the things that you used to ignore. And uh, you're, you're taking things that have higher costs in many cases. Now, that's a disadvantage. But there are also some advantages in terms of insurance networks, spreading risk, and uh, a number of other things uh, that, that could be called advantages even a possibly greater efficiency in the sense of an economy of scale, able to support slightly higher human populations on the same amount of territory. There's a, no, there's a social aspect as well. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Animal domestication, well, basically, that is literally managing of meat sources. And it, it's lots of work. It really is lots of work. And it's also uh, probably energetically not all that uh, superior just to a, a hunting and gathering lifestyle unless it is coupled with intensive plant exploitation. The other thing uh, is that meat, in a sense, can be stored. So to finish up then, social ramifications. A united focus, or at least a very he heavy focus, on uh, large game hunting when s groups tend to be very small is that you're always faced with a labor so shortage. And what that may mean socially is that there is a very strong incentive for most members of a group to be in close contact with each other, or at least they can be rounded up very easily, uh, very quickly. And this may, uh, Steve Kuhn and I have speculated, amount to less autonomy for women. With the expansion of the diet, that changes. What you have is an intense cooperation among individuals because at least in, in a short-term basis, or at least at certain age grades, people actually specialize in certain kinds of skills. And then they bring these things, uh, the fruits of their, their foraging labor, back together uh, in order to uh, gain more, more calories, more energy from the same unit of uh, land area. Animal domestication could very well be a solution for the tragedy of the commons in a world in which populations are increasing and uh, the availability of wild large meat stocks is declining, or at least it's becoming unbearably unpredictable. This can support higher population densities, as I, I noted, but only if, uh, if it's combined with uh, plant use. Meat security is improved this way but it's no longer coming from a common pool. And it's from this kind of situation that ideas have grown about a burgeoning sense of ownership and autonomy, not at the level of the individual now, but at the level of the corporate group. Okay. So energetic and social changes are closely intertwined in human evolution. Dietary changes definitely affect environmental carrying capacity and human population densities. And finally, humans solve problems 
by ever more complex solutions, which is probably why it's often, not always, but so often difficult to go back. Thank you very much.